Well, I have 12 o'clock noon, so I want to go ahead and start the session today. Uh, we are so glad that you're here and sharing your time with us. We have a full lineup of topics to discuss with you today, and hopefully you'll walk away with a little bit of knowledge that you can apply to your garden. Um, our first person that we'll be talking today, well, actually, before I get going with that, let me just go ahead and uh, show you some other things here. Maybe. There we, oops, there we go, sorry. Um, I just wanted to remind you of where the horticultural specialists are located around the state. Um, we have somebody nearly in every region of the state. We have a couple of openings, but don't let that scare you. Please reach out to really anyone. Uh, we, we don't really recognize the borders. It's not that big of a deal. So we're happy to help in any way, shape or form. So, but you can kind of find your area and maybe take a look at the person that might be um, available to help you. And then I just wanted to let you know where some of these things are found. Uh, you can live stream with us on YouTube or you can join the Zoom here. Um, if After it's done, you can go back and watch the recording and watch some of the little snippets. Those are all available for you to look at. So I think with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing and I'm looking forward to Zach's weather report. Great, thank you, Gwen. And uh, as I'm getting my slides here, just want to comment that it's much warmer than the last time we all joined here for the, the garden hour. So that's exciting. And uh, that'll be a, a theme I talk about today is, is some of that warmth. But first, I, I did want to summarize January for 2024. Uh, we, we ended up the month actually cooler than normal. Um, so uh, thinking about those very cold two weeks in the middle of the month, they really influenced our temperatures. And we saw uh, Missouri statewide temperature of, of 27.9 was about a, a degree and a half Fahrenheit below normal. So nothing record breaking, um, but certainly it was notable because this was our, our first month where the statewide average temperature was actually below normal for 14 months. So going back to October of 2022 was the last time we had a, a cooler than normal month in Missouri. Uh, the bigger story probably was actually all of the precipitation we saw Last month, it was a very uh, wet month with our, our statewide precipitation average of three and a half inches, uh, about an inch and a half above normal. And so this was good enough for our uh, 14th wettest January on record. And if you look at the, the January precipitation map here, almost the entire state got at least a couple of inches of rain, um, but there were some really impressive totals to the southeast and uh, upwards of seven inches in, in parts of the boot heel as well. But not all of this precipitation came in the form of rainfall. We, we also saw some snow, particularly if you're, you're north of I-70 or the Missouri River. So on the left here, if we, we look at our accumulated snowfall, that northern third of the state, roughly 6 to 12, uh, with some uh, 12 to 18 inch totals uh, along the Iowa border as well. But if you were south of I-70, um, not a lot of that precipitation was snowfall, a lot more rainfall during January. And this is kind of the trend we saw in December and now in February as well, uh, where we're not seeing a lot of heavy snow. And, and really the only areas of the state, if we look at our, our percent of normal so far this season here on the right, the only green we see is in that uh, northern couple tiers of counties across the state. Otherwise here we can see this big area of, of yellow showing 50% uh, or less of, of normal seasonal snowfall. So um, definitely still running, running below normal and, and running out of time to accumulate that snowfall through the winter here. Uh, but the precipitation also uh, did help with, with drought conditions. So this was something we were worried about a lot of last fall and, and going into winter and looking at our, our US drought monitor map from December 26 compared to February 13th, we see a lot of improvement here and, and most notably a, a lot less drought coverage and uh, decreased severity too. So less of these oranges and reds that showed that severe and extreme drought. Uh, so this is a big benefit of that, that extra precipitation in January. And while we still have some areas that are a little dry and even experiencing moderate dry drought in February, much improved of where we are last fall and, and early winter. Uh, but enough looking back at, at January with the cooler and, and wetter conditions, because once we got into February, we flipped the pattern completely. And so far, 
February has been very wet, very dry and very warm as well. So just looking at, at some of our major sites across the state here, um, all sites are running well above normal so far in February for temperatures. So anywhere from 7.3 degrees above normal in Springfield to 10.6 degrees above normal in Kansas City, we've really uh, been enjoying that warmth. Uh, additionally, we've been very dry. So here we see across all of these sites are around an inch or so below normal for February. And if we look at our, our precipitation map on the right for February, the only spots that have really received more than an inch are, are Springfield, Joplin, and uh, some of extreme southern Missouri. But the rest of the state's been, been pretty dry. I can attest in Columbia, where we see the yellow here, I've only got uh, 0.21 inches in my rain gauge uh, for February so far. And so if February were, were to end today, we're definitely close to record-breaking territory for temperatures. And so all of our sites are on track for the second or third warmest at this point. Um, but we'll talk to you here in the minute. Looking at the forecast, I think some of these cities might make a run at their all-time uh, warmest February on record. I, I don't think we're going to have enough to break the statewide record for, for average temperature, but definitely I think we'll see some February records fall for temperatures. We are drier than normal, um, but not record breaking with precipitation like we are with our warm temperatures. And I also want to note that while February has been very dry, climatologically, this is actually Missouri's driest month of the year. On average, we receive just over two inches of rainfall or precipitation, um, but this varies quite a bit throughout the state. So in February, you might still be getting close to four inches of rainfall in the boot heel, uh, but if you were to go all the way to the northwest in Atchison County, uh, only receiving about three quarters of an inch on average. So it definitely looks different across the state, but it is our driest month. And as we head into March and head into spring, um, that's going to change pretty dramatically next month. So we bump up our average precip to over three inches. And we can see here on our, our map of Missouri, um, the whole state tends to see much more precipitation. So on average, we're definitely getting ready to go into a wetter time of year, uh, which is our spring period. But first looking uh, kind of in the near term is that we do have more warm weather on the way. And so Here's a, a map of our high temperatures across the United States today. The colored shading shows the departure from climatology, and you can see a bullseye right over Missouri in the Midwest with some of those deep reds and, and even kind of magenta there as well. And that's showing that, that our highs today in the, the 70s um, are really 20 to 30 degrees above normal. So really anomalous uh, warmth that we're seeing today that's gonna help keep pushing us towards those records. To go along with all of this warmth, uh, what we're seeing is, is this warm and moist air mass arriving ahead of a, a pretty small system that's going to bring us some rainfall tomorrow. But we could even have some thunderstorms later today and tonight across the state. Um, this graphic is from the National Weather Service in Springfield, Missouri, and it shows that the Storm Prediction Centers highlighted us for actually a, a marginal risk for, for small hail uh, down in southwest Missouri today. Um, I don't think it's going to be anything sp uh, significant, but wanted to include this because don't be surprised if you hear a few rumbles of thunder really anywhere across the state over the next uh, 36 hours or so as, as that warmth kind of gives us enough energy for, for thunderstorms to develop in February. But overall, once we start to see some of these showers and storms develop tonight, we'll probably see them more organized by tomorrow. So on the left here, we see our, our forecast for tomorrow morning. We see a cold front moving across Missouri with some precipitation alongside. I think we'll generally start clearing out pretty quickly throughout Thursday afternoon. Uh, and precipitation totals look pretty light from this event. So on the right here, um, probably a bullseye if you were in Cape Girardeau, maybe the highest forecast of up to a half inch, but really looks more like a tenth to a quarter of an inch for the rest of Missouri. So not a significant amount of rain over the next couple of days. But after we get through Thursday, uh, the big story is going to be a, a warm up over the weekend and into next week. So uh, behind that cold front on Friday, we're a little cooler, but still well above normal uh, temperatures in the 50s, touching 60. But look on Sunday and then on Tuesday for next week. So these are forecast high temperatures well into the 70s 
uh, by Tuesday. And this will be uh, potentially record-breaking uh, warmth across the state during this time. It'll also be very pleasant. Here's our, our probability of precipitation for these days as well. And really our next rain chance isn't uh, until getting into Tuesday and Wednesday of next week after tonight and tomorrow. So enjoy that, that beautiful weekend and early next week. I think we'll have plenty of sunshine to go along with those temps. And looking forward uh, eight to 14 days as we get into the beginning of March, really looks like this pattern could continue that first week of March, especially with a likelihood of above normal temperatures and maybe a little bit of, of wetter conditions getting into March. But finally, I wanna end here because we're talking a lot about really warm temperatures and that may make us think about wanting to get outside and maybe even think about when's a good time to get in the garden with, with temperatures in the middle 70s. But I wanna caution in that we still have plenty of cold air around climatologically. So if we look here at our uh, last spring hard freeze and frost dates on average across Missouri, um, really, unless you're in, in Southeast Missouri or in Metro St. Louis, on average, we don't see our last hard freeze until that first week of April with frosts occurring through the month of April. So um, that's all to say that we could still have quite a bit of cold air uh, or winter's last gasp as we get into March and, and put this uh, warm period in February behind us. So uh, could definitely see a possibility for those cooler temperatures. And uh, finally, I know there's also been some questions when we think about the length of the growing season and how it pertains to some of those new plant hardiness maps from the USDA. And so just wanted to show some, some research that was conducted here uh, by the Missouri Climate Center by the previous state climatologist, Pat Ganan, which showed um, really looking at our long-term data back to 1895 in just the past 20 years, that we are seeing these either first fall frost or last spring frost dates changing. And so what this means is um, in general, we're adding about five or six days on average to, to either end of the growing season by either pushing that fall frost back or making the, the spring frost earlier. So I think that was reflected in those hardiness maps, but definitely shows that our Missouri growing season is getting longer. And you can't maybe take this information and just subtract six days from what we might expect this year, uh, because we still see quite a bit of year-to-year -year variability. But overall, the long-term trend is, is that we're seeing a slightly longer growing season across the state. And so that's all I've got for today. Hope everyone can get outside and enjoy the nice weather. Oh, thank you, Zach. That was great. Um, I, I wondered if I've, I've read that uh, we can expect about nine days of more growing. So that's kind of in line with what you just said, too. So that's great. Absolutely. All right. We're going to get into our uh, sessions and I'm going to turn it over to Ramon and he will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Wen. Uh, yeah, I'm Ramon Arancibia, horticulture specialist in the West Central region of Missouri. And I'll be the moderator today. And we have a few topics to talk about and a few questions to answer that you all have uh, submitted. And remember that you can submit the questions uh, through the website, through the uh, in, uh, MU Extension website. So our first topic today is gonna be about uh, 2000, 2024 is a period of cicada year. And they will be in Missouri, and Tamra Real is going to talk about that. Thanks, Ramon. So yeah, we're going to talk about periodical cicadas. Uh, they we have a few different broods that are here, but this is this is a really big year for cicadas. Um, so just just a quick reminder of the difference between periodical cicadas and annual cicadas. Because when I'm talking to people, they're like, well, we have cicadas every single year. What's what's the big deal? So yes, annual cicadas, they come out every single year. There's a lot of different species, like uh, over 3,000. Um, you can see right here, this is one of our species. They are large. Um, they usually have, they have a life cycle of two to five years, and some of them come out every single year. We usually hear them in July and August. Uh, so so yeah, every year, but the periodical cicadas, these are some that come out either every 13 or 17 years, depending on the brood. 
There are seven different species. You can see here that they are quite a bit smaller. They have a black body. They have red eyes. Um, occasionally, you'll have some, some genetic differences, and you might actually see white or blue eyes, which is interesting. But um, that black and orange slash red coloration is, is very typical. These will be coming out in late April through early July. These are native to the Eastern North America. They are not found anywhere else in the world, so we're pretty special. Another fun thing about periodical cicadas is the males synchronize their singing. So that's why it can get so loud and you just have that, that hum through the time that they are, they are out. So um, again, these are periodical cicadas. They are in the genus Magis cicada because it's a magical experience, at least for us entomologists and hopefully everybody else. Um, it seemed like magic when they would just come out of the ground, they would be here for four to six weeks and then they would disappear and not come back for so many years. Um, so they they got the name Magis cicada. All right, another uh, thing, a lot of people will call these locusts. They are not actually locusts. Locusts are uh, uh, similar to grasshoppers, um, a short horned grasshopper that has a swarming phase. While cicadas do swarm or they have this swarming emergence, they are very different than what actual locusts are. So this map shows you the different broods that are out there. You can see there are 17 year broods and 13 year broods. 17 year broods are typically in the Northern areas and 13 year old, 13 year broods are typically in the Southern areas. There are a lot of different broods. Um, so this, this is one of the broods that's emerging this year, brood 13. It's in Northern Illinois and those states up there. And then we have brood 19, which is a much broader area. And they are, they're, th th these are the ones that we will see in Missouri. Here's a little more information about the broods. Um, again, this is the one that we will see in Missouri, brood 19, called the Great Southern Brood. There is a chance some of the other brood will 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 have a few stragglers over here, um, but pretty much it's just brood brood nineteen. Four different species um, coming out in late April through the first and second week of May. Because some questions I get mostly why are there so many um and we don't really know that yet uh we think it's because it overwhelms the predators when there's so many um they're going to get eaten birds are able to gorge on them squirrels and even your dogs and cats will be eating them um and there's so many that there's still many left to be able to lay eggs so it overwhelms that predatory um that inclination also, uh, more studies are showing that it could also be to avoid parasitic fungi or specialist predators. Our regular cicadas, our annual cicadas, have a specialist predator, the cicada wasp, um, and, and they do not affect these because they are, they're out at a, a di completely different time. So there are, there's a history of these emerging and there being so many that they will completely cover trees and you might actually have to use a snow shovel to clean up. We don't actually think that's gonna happen with this one because um, it's only one brood in Missouri, though there may be some areas where there are that many, but that probably isn't as likely this year. Uh, also, are cicadas safe? Are they going to bite you? Are they going to sting you? No, they they won't. Um, and like I said, your pets probably will eat them if they're outside and they're going to be fine. You probably don't want them just eating them, uh, so many of them, but um, they'll, they'll probably be fine and you will be fine. The thing that we do have to worry about though are young trees. So young trees that have branches that are about the size of your finger, that's where the eggs are gonna be laid. And if there, if there are a lot of cicadas that actually can affect the health of your trees, the small trees, your big, large, healthy trees are gonna be fine. Um, after the cicadas have been here, uh, they'll, you might actually see a bunch of dead branches on the end. Um, that's called flagging. Yes, it will, they'll drop, um, but your tree is gonna be fine. For those young trees, we do recommend that you cover them with a fine mesh, about a quarter inch um, mesh or smaller, and that, that'll protect them from the cicadas. Uh, better yet, if you're thinking of planting things this year, you might wanna wait until next year. So another thing um, I've been asked, what pesticides should we use? Pesticides are not recommended because they're not effective. 
these insects are strong flyers. So even if you were to put something on your tree uh, and kill what's there, um, more, more cicadas can come anyway. So this is not what's recommended. Again, your trees are gonna be fine unless they're young. So um, you want to exclude the, the cicadas from even being able to get there. Um, if you do use pesticides, uh, keep in mind that you're probably going to be, it could affect the birds that eat them or the other animals that eat them um, or beneficial pollinators. There's some more information. I will drop these links in the chat so that you have them, um, but there's a lot of information out there. You can always reach out to your local extension office. And then I do want to mention this. This site, cicadasafari.org, is a really great site for more information about them. Um, also, if you want to be part of helping scientists understand the range of where these emergences happen, please uh, download Cicada Safari app. Um, it's available on Apple and Google. And this is really important because when you have cicadas or an insect that is, most of their life cycle is underground and they only emerge every 17 or 13 years, it's really hard to do research on them. And so this makes it for a perfect citizen science project, which allows us to be able to add data for where they're found. Scientists can't go around everywhere and try and find them, but if you find them, you can add that information. And that's also can be helpful with the different species because they are not all in equal numbers. Some of them are more rare than others. So um, this is a chance for you to be involved and, and help us with that. Also with the change in weather um, and climate, we don't know how that impacts these cicadas. So being able to add data to scientists who are studying this is going to be able to help scientists detect changes over time. And while I'm talking about citizen science projects, this is another one that we just learned about. Um, this is the squash pollinator search. I'll drop this link into the chat, um, but this is a group that, that studies um, squash bees and other squash pollinators, and they're trying to learn more about them. And we just got an email about this asking for um, some extension master gardeners from other states to be able to participate. So if you are interested in this, I will drop that in the chat. Um, it sounds like a really fun project. So that's it for today. I hope you're excited. Yes, it's warm weather. Be patient. Um, we're, we're almost there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, Tamra. That was interesting. So we're going to go to our next uh, Topic actually is a, is a question that we're going to try to answer. Uh, let me see. And it would be my job to answer these questions. Uh, one of this particular question is, uh, the question was, is wilt proof uh, good for a skip laurel? Uh, wilt proof is one of the anti-transparent products, commercial products in the market. Uh, so we're going to talk about general anti-transparent uh, in the market or what they do and what are they used for. Yeah, uh, you see the pictures on the side, that's actually the skip laurel. Uh, we, I'm going to talk about skip laurel in, in the next slide, but uh, anti-transparent is what we should focus on the, uh, based on these questions. And anti-transparents are used to reduce excessive water loss and desiccation. They have several uses in the market. Uh, they is used in transplants to reduce transplant shocks for uh, succulent plants. Uh, sometimes it's used in post-harvest shipping uh, to reduce the shock when it's uh, changed from one environment to another that it might affect the plant. So it's used in there too. Uh, to reduce, uh, when there is a drought in the summer, of course, if it uh, reduces the loss, water loss, it will help uh, the plant during a drought to survive a little longer. And uh, what we're gonna talk about here is desiccation of every uh, uh, evergreens in winter. Uh, the skip laurel is an evergreen shrub that is used uh, like you see here in the garden or hedge rows too. So it's a, a, a plant that is a wild, wild uh, used uh, in many places. So evergreen uh, shrubs uh, have the higher damage uh, by desiccation in late winter, early spring with warm or dry air, but when the soil is still too cold or even frozen. And what happens there is that the roots are not active enough to supply water to the foliage, 
that is still transpiring because it's an evergreen uh, shrub. So if there is a warm day, they're going to transpire. They need water from the roots. But if the soil is too cold and roots are not active, there's going to be a deficit of water. And that produces the desiccation of uh, the foliage. And this, that's the winter damage. Uh, so uh, what is a skip or skip uh, Cheryl Laurel? That's what we're talking about. It's in the Rosacea family. Uh, Prunus lauroceracus is very close to peach. Actually, peach is also Prunus. So this is one, uh, it seems like it's an evergreen. Peach is not evergreen. So that that's, uh, makes a big difference. And that's why, why it's susceptible to winter damage by desiccation. It, the origin is in the Skipa Pass in the mountains separating India from Nepal. That's why the the name comes from Skip uh, uh, Skipa. So that's the origin of this uh, shrub. It tolerates uh, a good tolerator of alkaline soils as well as dry and poor soils. But still, in the winter, if there is not enough water, uh, uh, it can it can uh, uh, be affected. Tolerates pruning and it could tolerate shade well too. Uh, need moist soil and water in regularly, especially in hot summers. So even though it's a, it seems like it can handle a little dry, uh, particularly in the winter, it's better to keep the soil moist to avoid uh, 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 winter damage. Uh, it, it, prunes, uh, it needs pruning to maintain the size. I mean, in a hedge rose, you see, you keep the pruning there, but the plant can grow as, as much as 18 feet tall. So it can become a big tree if you don't uh, maintain it. Uh, it doesn't have many uh, serious pest and disease problems. So it's a good plant for your garden or for your hedge row. Uh, when we think about management to reduce the fridge damage in a uh, freeze damage in every evergreens, uh, don't think just using the anti-transparent. It's a tool that you can use, but you have to uh, take in consideration alternative uh, ways of uh, controlling the, the damage and what are the pros and the cons of the anti-transparent. The three type of anti-transparent film forming, which are uh, pine resin or waxes uh, that is used to this, they're spraying the foliage and act as a physical obstacle to water loss. There are some metabolic or growth regulator like abscisic acid that promotes stomata closeness. So when the plant closes the stomata, it stops transpiring and that's a way to maintain the water and reduce desiccation of the foliage. And there are those other ones that are reflective that reduce the incidence of excessive solar radiation. And that, those particular are used in the summer, not necessarily in the winter. So if you're going to use a, an anti-transparent, uh, anti read the label to learn what, how to use it and, the, and take the precautions uh, necessary. The effectiveness of these uh, anti-transparents depend on many factors including the type of antitranspirant. We mentioned uh, several of them in the above, uh, the rate that you use, and the environmental conditions and plant species. So because of all these factors that are very variable in many cases, there is no guarantee that they're going to work. Uh, the literature that I review indicate positive results most of the time, but there is no guarantee that they're going to work. They, the other the con of using this uh, uh, anti-transpirant is exactly that because they reduce air exchange that uh, affect photosynthesis. If you're stopping water loss, you're also stopping air exchange, carbon dioxide and oxygen in and out of the foliage. So photosynthesis is also affected and it may weaken the plant in the long run. And there are some uh, evergreens, trees, or shrubs that are not recommended to use this anti-transpirant, particularly those with scale-like leaves, uh, like junipers, arboritae, cypress, and others. Uh, it's not recommended to use this uh, uh, anti-transpirant. 
but you have alternative to protect the plants against a freeze. I mean, a, yeah, desiccation damage or freeze damage or winter damage. Is keeping the soil moist, watering and mulching before ground freezes or, or when it's too cold, hopefully to maintain the ground a little warmer than uh, uh, if, if it's not covered. That's what mulching is. It will help in uh, maintaining the ground a little warmer. Uh, you can use covers. All kind of covers are nowadays in the market. Are the, based on the literature and what I've, I've read is the best protection to winter manage. But you don't want to put something that is topping the, I mean, it's, it doesn't look nice in your garden, in your yard. So it's something that you have to take in consideration. Uh, but it's effective in protecting against freezing or the dry wind. That's the main part when the, the desiccation of the plant is the dry wind during freezing, a uh, dry wind that will desiccate those uh, those uh, that foliage. Uh -huh. Not necessarily freeze them, but desiccate them. Um, and uh, covers that we can talk about is plastic films, spoon bonded fabric, that is the uh, normal row cover that is used a lot or, or, or um, uh, freeze cover or, or blankets. Uh, burlaps, etc. Anything that will cover and protect the plant, reduce the, the heat loss, as, but mostly will stop the wind, the dry wind during freezing time. And in many cases, we use irrigation, I mean, over sprinkler irrigation to maintain a water ice layer, of a, uh, an ice layer, water ice layer on top of the plant or on top of those fabrics to reduce the freezing damage. And that can be helpful too, to reduce the winter damage. And with that, uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat box and maybe we can answer anyone that is there. So, is there any question there? No that question, person, Ramon. No? No yes. Question, Ramon. No. Okay. Well, if you come up with a question, you can write it and you can submit it again and we can review this, this uh, subject later on in another uh, time. So we're going to continue then. Uh, hold on a second. We're going to continue to our next topic uh, and it's going to be about what's the best approach for planting North Sky a bush, two years old, three foot high blueberry bushes in Lake Osage, Missouri. South, southwest sun landscape, terrace or container. And Druba is gonna address this uh, question. Uh, go ahead, Druba. All right, thank you, Ramon. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, thank you. So the question is, uh, what is the best approach for planting two-year-old, three feet tall, North Sky blueberry in container or in the field? So let me describe briefly different types of blueberries. So the first one is high bush blue, uh, blueberries. They are tall and they are cultivated varieties. The second ones are low bush. Uh, low bush blueberries are wild. They are not planted, but some people manage them to pick. Uh, as by their name, they tend to be uh, uh, small in size. The third category of blueberry is half high blueberries, such as North Sky variety. The half high varieties are dwarf blueberry varieties, and they are developed by crossing between low bush and high bush varieties. So they are about half of the height of high bush. Uh, they grow about two to three feet in tall. Uh, as we can see uh, in, this, in this picture on the right, uh, so uh, it is a dwarf variety uh, and it is planted in a container and, and uh, it, is, uh, it is producing berries very well. So these varieties uh, have uh, excellent uh, Winter, uh, winter hardiness, and they can be grown in uh, USDA uh, hardiness zones from three to five. So they can tolerate low temperature up to negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and uh, their berries are juicy and have sweet taste. 
So let me go to the question whether we can plant North Sky half high blueberry in the container. Yes, it is a perfect variety for planting in the container uh, as this is a dwarf variety and has compact mounting uh, habit. Uh, it grows about two to three feet tall and uh, about two feet wide. So this variety is also good for planting in the landscape as it produces snow white bl uh, uh, blooms in the spring. Uh, it produces deep uh, sky blue berries uh, ripen in July and, and their leaves turn to brilliant red color in the fall. So its berries have rich wild blueberry flavor. So if it is well managed, uh, we can produce one to two pounds of uh, berries from a bush in a year. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So I talk briefly about the container planting. So for container planting, uh, we can use about 15 to 20 gallons container and make sure so uh, there is some drainage holes in the container. And for the planting mix, we recommend uh, using a mixture of uh, uh, one third of good quality topsoil about one third uh, plant-based well-decomposed compost and one third peat moss or coconut coir. So for a blueberry, uh, we need to adjust the soil pH as uh, it requires the uh, ACT growing media. So to adjust pH, uh, we should mix about a cup of uh, powder sulfur during potting mix preparation for the 15 to 20 gallon pot. Uh, the second thing we have to be careful is when we transplant the uh, the blueberry plant in a pot, make sure the crown or color of a plant is located at the soil surface. And blueberry plant requires full sunlight. So make sure to keep the container in sunny area. Uh, it also requires plenty of water. So make sure water the pot regularly, uh, especially in the uh, dry and hot summer. So for planting blueberry in the field, uh, we should consider some factors uh, uh, during the site selection for planting blueberry. Uh, the field should be well drained. So ideal soil for blueberry production is sandy type soil with low soil pH, and the soil should be rich in uh, uh, OM content, organic matter content. Uh, as blueberry requires acidic soil, we should test our soil before planning for planting blueberry in the field. And if, uh, uh, if the elemental sulfur is recommended to apply during soil test, we need to apply that. Uh, uh, we need to apply that amount before planting to adjust soil pH. And blueberry is planted uh, either in late fall or uh, early, early spring. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it requires full sunlight. So in the field, uh, north-south orientation for rows during planting is the uh, is the best. So this crop requires good uh, air circulation. So when we select the field, uh, elevated sites are recommended uh, in the in the field, and make sure uh, we have a good quality. Uh, irrigation water is available uh, near to the blueberry field to uh, to uh, uh, irrigate the blueberry. So uh, there is a very good bulletin on growing blueberries in Missouri published by Missouri State University. So we have provided the link of that bulletin in the chat box. So please go through that bulletin in detail. That's all I have. Thank you, Dhruva. Uh, all right, so we're gonna go to our next topic. Actually, it's a question to, uh, what's the best ornamental drought tolerant grasses grown in rocky soils? And uh, Todd Higgins is gonna answer, address that question. Todd? Thanks, Ramon. And I'll be sharing my screen here just a second. And hopefully everybody can see that. <clears throat> um, that's a great question. The, the problem with it is, I, oh, excuse me, I shared the wrong screen.
Okay. The um, the challenge with the question is really not the rockiness, but whether or not it's a sandy soil underneath or a clay soil underneath. And this picture here came from the University of New Hampshire. And as a native New Englander, um, when we would garden or farm, uh, plowing or tilling, it was not uncommon to unearth rocks of this size. But the soil itself... Todd, Todd can you, can you ex expand that into a, um, uh, a PowerPoint? I mean, you are in the, there. There we go. How's that? There you got it. Sorry. Um, so we got we kick out rocks this size, typically, you know, as they work up through the soil over winter. Uh, but the soil itself was relatively sandy, didn't have that much clay content. Here in Missouri, uh, a lot of our rocky soils have clay content, and the reason that that becomes a challenge is that many of the ornamental grasses that are recommended here in Missouri do require good drainage. Uh, so the other two questions are have to do with fertility as well as, as the drainage factor. So these are the challenges. Now there's an ex uh, extension publication for ornamental grasses. I've put the website in the chat but it's also listed here on this slide. Uh, Dr. Trinkline did this a few years ago. And what it comes down to is that for ornamental grasses, blue fescue is a grass that can tolerate uh, the rocky type soils if they're not extremely well uh, drained, as can mether, uh, Mexican feather grass, ribbon grass, northern sea oats, Japanese bloodgrass, and a switchgrass. So th these are listed as ornamentals, but there are some native grasses that could also be used in an ornamental situation, and they are tolerant of the clay soils that we have here in Missouri, and those are big blue stem, Indian grass, Little blue stem, switchgrass, and love grass. So these these are grasses. They typically prefer to be planted in full sun. Uh, again, drainage. If you have good drainage but rocky soil and good fertility, other grasses could be added to this mix that are in outlined here in this publication. So the real question comes down again is what's the underlying soil that those rocks are found in? Um, so there are places where some of the more attractive ornamental grasses will just not work due to the clay content of the soil and poor drainage. And that's what I have. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> so we're going to go to our next topic, and when is going to address starting seeds. Uh, when? All right. Are you seeing yes. my screen? Or is it just a, is it just a, yeah, it pull is. this up a little bit bigger? Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, starting your seeds. I would like to do a little poll here in the chat, and I just would like to know if you are already starting seeds, and, and like indoors, and maybe what kind of plants you are starting. Are you starting cabbages or broccoli or tomatoes? Just kind of pop that in the chat if you would. I'd just kind of like to see what people are, are doing. Um, so... I, you know, with this warm weather, we just kind of want to get out there and start digging in the soil. And I know it's really hard not to, but I want to go through some things about um, how to start your seeds. So the first thing is uh, know that your seeds are reliable. Um, seeds can stay viable for a long time, but if you 
um, buy a seed packet from a big box store, you might want to look on the back and see when it was packaged, the date that it was packaged for. Sometimes it might be 10 years old, and if that seed has not been stored correctly, they might not do very well. Uh, seeds mainly need to be kept cool and dry. So in some of your retail places, they might be out in a, and I'm thinking Missouri hot summers in July, it's hot and humid, and that's not really good for the seed viability. Um, you also want to know what varieties do well here. And there have been some trials, and the MU Extension has a vegetable planting calendar that also lists some of the varieties that are tried and true that deal with our weird weather that we have here. Your media that you wanna use, make sure that it's well-drained, it's loose and fine textured. You want it to be sterile, which means you don't want a lot of bacteria, um, a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> you know things that might make it moldy, uh, fungus and things like that. And when you're starting the seeds, you really don't need fertilizer at this point when you're just starting to, to grow them. Two pieces of information that you need to know, and Zach kind of mentioned this earlier, is what zone are you in and what's your freeze date? And this is a, an older one that you see here on the right or on the left. And we know that that might shift just a little bit based on the, the new zones and our new climate data that's coming in. And then if you know your zone, like with um, whether you're north, central or south, um, it's, that kind of helps you know when you should start your, your seeds. So when you're starting your seeds, it's, you, it's a really good or a good idea not to just plant everything all at once. Your seed starting time frame really can be from three to 15 weeks, depending on what you're trying to start. So you may have some things that you're planting and then you may have some other things that are starting to grow and you're getting ready to harden them off. So it is kind of a little, a little bit of a, a juggling match when you start this, but it's depending on the plant and what you're, you're growing, you do want to kind of vary that a little bit. We basically break down crops into cool season and warm season crops. So I've listed some cool season crops here, cauliflower, cucumber, and egg, well, I, sorry, cucumber and eggplant are warm season crops. But you can see that we, probably don't want to start those right away or all at the same time. We have a range from late February to late April when you're looking at that. So you kind of have to take that into consideration when you're starting your flats or starting your trays. Some other considerations, the amount of water that you uh, have. I have a picture up there in the upper right corner um, is called damping off. That's when you have too much water and it causes a fungus around the soil uh, plant interface and it causes the, the plant basically to damp off right there. Or you could have too little and that will cause wilting. So while your watering has to be kind of, uh, watch your plants every day and you know be aware of what's going on with them. The amount of light inside is very important as well. If you have um, some of the seeds will need light to germinate. For example, lettuce will need light to germinate, but it also likes a little like 24 hours to 48 hours of darkness to let the water absorb into the seed. And then you remove that and it expose it to light and then it will germinate from that. So some vegetables need that light to germinate. Others don't need the light to germinate. Um, when you're starting them with the light, you want the light pretty close to the top of your seedling, like within a couple of inches, and then you're going to have to move that light up as you as a plant grows. If you don't have enough light, the plants etoliate. I hope I'm saying that right word right. That's how I was was taught it. But the plants get really lanky, and they get tall, and then they fall over. So. The term that I was taught is foolish seedling disease because they grow really tall and then they just fall over because they get too, too much. And that usually comes from being uh, not enough light in the, in the system. And then your temperature is also so, something that you will need to consider. Some like a warm seed bed to germinate. So you'll need to research a little bit with that. And then also some of them like cooler temperatures. And then your fertilizer, I mentioned that when you plant the seeds, you probably do not need to have fertilizer at that point. However, once they start to grow, you might want to add in a diluted fertilizer. 
but you want to be very gentle with that uh, because if you add too much too soon, it can burn the plants because they're very fragile at that point and um, they, they won't survive. Yeah, my thing froze here. Hold on just a moment. Okay, so then you might think about when to transplant them outdoors. And again, you will want to look at that frost date because things like cabbage and cauliflower, you can set up, set out maybe a couple of weeks before the last um, frost date. Um, so you kind of have to count backwards with that, but you want to um, harden them off first. You don't want to just take your seed that's been all protected with perfect temperature, perfect water, perfect light, and then plop them outside in the environment. We need to you know, kind of back that up a little bit and give them a hardening off time, which is about two weeks before you plant them outdoors. And you start gentle, maybe move them to a kind of a shady or diffuse light situation, or maybe it's a little bit cooler than what you had them in, and then just gradually increase the temperature, gradually increase the light, um, and gradually increase the air movement before you actually plop them in the garden. Um, you want to protect them from high winds, from high uh, temperatures, and that kind of thing. And it's always best to try to plant, transplant on a cloudy day and then water as you plant them. And that is all I have for this little talk. And feel free to ask any questions that you might have. And um, sure, we'll be happy to help you. Any questions so far for any of the talks? Uh, no, Ramon, no question. Okay, so we're gonna go to our next topic. Uh, Debbie, she's gonna talk about what are some ideas to start growing earlier in the spring. Debbie? Yeah, hi everyone. So um, this is following what Gwen has, has talked about. So we get really anxious in the spring. Uh, we really wanna start those seeds. And as Zach said, it's gonna be probably a little bit warmer, a little bit earlier. And Debbie, then all this, oops, yes? You gotta change and uh, expand that uh, that, re, uh, that uh, view, You're, you have the- Okay, I am using two screens right now because I did get it. So let me do something a little bit different here, guys. Sorry about all this. Is that better? No, it's the same. All righty, guys. Sorry about all this. Well, it Maybe can be no seen, worries. but... You can just go up to display settings. I'm um, at the top. Yeah. We'll click on that. Swap. Yep. I wish I knew that all the time. I wish you were around, Tamara. I'd do it much better next time. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. So here, um, just following up with Gwen, because we get excited in the spring, our late winter, and we really want to get back outside and we really want to do our stuff and get planted and anxious to get in the garden. And so what we end up doing is starting our seeds and we want to put them outside. And with the weather changing and adapting just a little bit, there's always a chance that we put our plants out too soon. But yeah, we need to protect them in some capacity to make sure that all the hard work we've already put in is going to come to fruition in the long run. So what I actually have here is just a bunch of pictures just to give you some ideas of what you could actually do to protect your crops as you put them into the garden. So let's look at this. So we have what are called floating row covers and low tunnels. So over on this side, you see actually the top left is going to be what we call a floating row cover. You kind of can put it over. It's a, it's a fine mesh that you can put onto the crops or onto your plants or onto your trees or bushes or shrubs or flowers. Uh, to protect them. And both of these, uh, the things I'm going to be showing you here can be done in the spring as well as into the fall. The middle picture is actually what we call a low tunnel. And that's what it looks like when it's up. The top right picture actually shows you those are like UVC piping or some something that you might be able to bend over. I've seen them where they go straight across the bed, but I've also seen them where you take two of them and you have an X and the X crosses in the middle of that bed. And sometimes that can help to hold up some of 
this low tunnel covering to protect your plants. It keeps it for a number of degrees a little bit warmer underneath all of these. Uh, low tunnels can also be used to help with um, insect and disease control somewhat. Debbie? Yes. It seems like your slides are not advancing. We have the same view as at the beginning. Okay. Man, guys, I am so sorry. I'm doing it on that screen. So let me come down and do it on the other screen. What I should do is just not have the screen connected. Debbie, if you can click on the duplicate slide, so I think that helps. Okay, now we're, did it move forward this time? No, it hasn't. Okay, guys, I am so sorry. So let me do this. It's amazing how even though we've been using Zoom for so long, things change and it just for you out happens. there in La La Land. Take a deep breath. It's going to be I fun. am. <laughs> the information is great whether or not we can see the right image. Okay. Now, can you guys see it okay? Now we can, we can see. Okay, great. So floating row covers and uh, low tunnels. So here's the picture of the floating row cover. Like I said, it's got that mesh. It helps to keep... Um, so the air moving through to the plants, but yet it helps to protect it almost like a little blanket. And that's directly on top of those uh, plants right there. And then we have what is called a low tunnel. So the bottom shows the picture of the mesh over what we call these PVC pipes or piping. So there's those that go across, or you can actually make it as an X where then those two will actually cross in the middle. And sometimes those work really well. And as you can see on the bottom right, you can go ahead if you so choose. And this is a floating one that's here, as well as a, a, the low tunnel there. And you notice they're being held down by bricks or sometimes with the soil. And if need be, if it gets really warm, you can just remove that, take that covering, that mesh over on the other side. So it's there in case you need to use it again in the future. And then we have what we call cold frames and hot beds. They really look identical to each other. The only thing is, is that the cold frames actually have no heat in it, whereas the hot beds actually will have some source of a heat where you might plug it into an outlet type of an environment. Uh, when I grew up as a kid, uh, the guy up the street for me had a lot of cold frames and he would have glass here. He would put the seeds in, then pull this uh, wooden hold down so that he could close it. And actually he could make that open up at different heights, depending upon how chilly it might be and how much heat was actually gathered inside of that cold frame. And then for the hot bed, essentially it's the same concept, except underneath the soil here, you might have some sort of a heating type of an element that helps to keep that soil warm. You'll notice that it has the front wall is always facing south, and then the back wall is always going to be facing north. Also in this top picture on the right, you'll notice it's against a brick wall, and usually a brick wall um, will gather that heat, especially if it's on the south side of a building, and it can help to put some of that heat from that brick down into that those beds as well. Other ideas are called clotches. Um, it's a really interesting term, clotches and hot caps. And so essentially all a clotch is is something that you're going to put over each individual plant. So you might have some hardy or semi-hardy cool season crops that are out there. And a lot of times we put our warm season crops out there, especially everybody wants to get those tomatoes started before the soil is too cold, but you want to put them out. So if it gets a little chilly, you can put clotches out. And you notice just these milk jugs, plastic milk jugs, or you can buy um, what they're called hot caps. And there's different kinds if you look at them over the internet. Uh, you do have to make sure that these have some soil over them so they actually will stay in place in case, in case it gets a little windy. And of course, your milk jugs are going to kind of jiggle them so they get down into the soil a little bit. This one on the left was kind of creative and inventive. Um, they actually did a plastic covering over like a little mini low tunnel. But when you're using the plastic, whether it's going to be on this particular one where they can lift it up and, and kind of on a hinge and pull it up for the day and then put it back down in the evening 
uh, is probably much easier than if it gets too hot during the day. Um, it can build up the heat on the inside of these clutches and these hot caps. So you might be pulling all of those off individually and putting them back on individually. So think about those sorts of things when you're trying to decide what you might want to use. Straw bales are used on an ongoing basis. I've seen this done. You'll notice that each one of these has a, a glass window of some sort. Uh, you do have to remember that what glass is going to penetrate in that sunlight that's coming through and it could have a tendency to really heat up the plants that are on the underside of that as well as that actually could burn the plants that are underneath of it if the sun is really, really intense. So Practice a little bit. Don't just put it out there and be gone for the day. If it's going to be a warm day, you'll probably need to pull that off or maybe actually um, put some sort of a shade cover or over it so that it doesn't have the sun going through as strong because you definitely don't want to burn those new seedlings that you've got out there. Other things, and this I thought was awfully interesting, is walls of water. And you can actually purchase them or you can make your own if you're creative enough. But you can see this one in the middle where you have these little pillars that are going all, there, all the way around that are, are connected to each other. And then the top view, you actually fill these with water. So they're hollow, fill them with water. During the daytime, that water is going to heat up on the inside of those pillars of this wall of water. And then in the evening, when the temperature lowers, the heat from the water is actually going to then seep and move towards the plant to try to keep it warm. So remember, hot air and cold air are going to move back and forth. So the hot air or the warmth actually of the water then is going to move towards the inside of that uh, wall of water. And here is just a picture that I found. It looks like it's those uh, quart size or I don't drink soda, but it looks like a soda bottle to me. And you fill it up with clean them out really well. Um, go ahead and put some water in it. Uh, and use some sort of duct tape to hold them all together. And again, you've created your own wall of water. So I thought that that one was pretty ingenious as well. And then just some other ideas that you may not know or to think about. I thought this one on the bottom right was creative. Uh, you know, if someone has a uh, purchases water, like a Culligan water, uh, that's what that bottle looks like to me. Um, and again, you're, just some of your different concepts and ideas. But remember, the plastic can get really hot. So you have to determine what that temperature is going to be. It will also get a lot of moisture on the inside. So you have to be careful that it doesn't get too wet on the plants where there might be some diseases that might occur. And of course, the good old sheet over the plants helps to protect them as well. And those are just some ideas that you all might um, be able to use as you're trying to keep your plants uh, growing this year after you get them out into the garden. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, that was interesting. Very good ideas. Uh, it can be used with the skip laurel too, that sheet that you put. Anyway, that's uh, all what we have for today. I'll pass it to Wen to conclude this uh, uh, garden hour for today. Wen? Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. Let me share just a couple of little things here. Again, I just wanted to remind you of where you can find us. Um, if you go to YouTube, U-M, sorry, M-U-I-P-M in the search box with YouTube, you can find uh, historical recordings of this. Um, we do have some, I'll give you the calendar coming up here. So um, today is the 21st. So March 20th will be our, our next garden hour. And then in April, from there, we will go week to week and week, you know, all through the growing season, week to week, starting in April. If you want your question answered, you can uh, submit it to the web, web address that you see there on the screen. And we'll be happy to get some research done and answer it for you. And just a reminder of the horticultural specialists that are around the state. And I think... Um, if you, there were a lot of um, links that were dropped in the chat. If you just go to the three little dots right here at the bottom of that, you can download those and save those. So you can have them for future reference. 
And I believe that is it. Again, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us and spending your time with us. We sure enjoy having you here. And I think with that, we will conclude today's Garden Hour. Thank you so much.